We are so thankful to be able to come to wherever your place of listening and viewing is with this gospel message. God is so good to continue to reveal himself to us in this age of great apostasy. There's a lot of religion in America, but there's very little salvation. And we thank the Lord for allowing us to hear the word of God by the Holy Spirit. We ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 2. 1 Timothy, chapter number 2. We shall begin reading with verse 13 and read through the rest of the chapter, which is only three verses. We'll read through verse 15, and in verse 15 is our title, Saved in Childbearing. This verse has given me a lot of trouble over the years. I didn't know what it meant, and God has let me come down to this age in life and this time in my ministry to be able to reveal it to me. Just need to be patient and wait on the Lord and he'll open up things as you need them. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 13, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so we see that uh, he is telling the truth, but it's falling hard upon the female, to know that Eve was the one that brought us into uh, uh, disrespect and disrepute with God. But the next verse helps us a great deal as we can understand it by the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, notwithstanding, and I want you to notice the, uh, the order here, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they, you need to notice that, it goes from the singular, she, Eve, uh, shall be saved in childbearing if they, the entirety of the female population, continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now let's see if we can get more into this and see what it means. Dear soul, you need to understand that just because we have been brainwashed by the harlot church system in our day and age of thinking, well, you got to hear a gospel message. So we say faith cometh by hearing and hearing comes by the Bible. That's not what it says. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. It's the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, not just hearing a gospel message. Thank God that while I was being saved by the Holy Spirit, being made alive, being quickened, I was listening to a gospel message at the same time. And I let the harlot system make me understand, and falsely so, so that it was by hearing that preacher preach that I got saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not done by human effort. The reason that I could hear what he was saying was because God had already quickened me and made me alive in Christ Jesus. Old brother B.B. Caldwell, a great prophet of God in our day and age, is dead and gone now, but he was a great man of God. He used to say, no sinner ever wanted a new heart till he already had one. You stop and think about that. You're dead in trespasses and sins, and when you, pry, when you pray and cry out to God and say, Lord, save me, it's because God already has made you alive, or you couldn't even have any consciousness or desire to be saved. So we see that God is telling us she, Eve, shall be saved in childbearing. We'll see that in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And listen at Genesis 3 and verse 15. She shall be saved in childbearing. Now, it changes over. If they, all the women, and not just women, but men as well, because women can't bear children without men. <clears throat> men have to penetrate and impart the seed, and the women have to receive it and bring forth the conception and the birth. So she shall be saved in childbearing, talking about Eve, if 
they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. It's not just bringing forth babies. Nobody ever thought that having a baby would save you. But he said, if they continue in faith. So there's something that happens that brings faith uh, in, that, in that relationship of that woman having that baby. We want to see that today. Now, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 18. How in the world can God righteously and rightly judge people who had no Bibles? Thousands of years there were no Bibles. The printing press hadn't been invented. The, the, the way that, uh, that that Ethiopian eunuch uh, had that uh, book of Isaiah, it was hand copied, was because he was a rich man. You had to be very rich to be able to afford any portion of the Bible because it had to be hand copied. So the man uh, had, a, had a, a copy of the book Isaiah of Isaiah when Philip went up and, and got into the chariot with him. So we understand and see that God is going to be able to judge the whole world long before there was Bibles printed, long before the scriptures were completed, long before uh, their soul, they were published and made available like they are to us today. It's just a small segment of the human population that we have been born into that have been graced with having so much scripture available to us. And so, but yet God's going to be able to judge every human being that's ever lived and do it righteously. How is he going to do that? Romans chapter 1 and verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. You agree with that? Well, sure we do. God's going to be able to judge and let His wrath fall upon everybody who, uh, who lives in ungodliness and unrighteousness. And they have to do so by suppressing the truth. Well, what truth did they have that they might suppress? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Every man, woman, boy, and girl has had God to show them the truth, without exception. Verse 20, For even the invisible things of God, the invisible things of the person of God, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, Jesus is the manifestation of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1 tells you that. So God is saying, even me in my invisibility from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Let me restructure that. Even God in his invisible essence can be clearly seen by the things that are made, by the creation of the world. Why did God set the world in order as he has? Because the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. We're going to look at that in Psalm 19. Everything in the world manifests God and Psalm 19 says the world even utters and has speech and it can say things to you and bring you to a knowledge of God. For the invis invisible things of Him, of God, by the creation of the world, are clearly seen. Listen. Being understood, God in His invisible essence is understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The world book will render you inexcusable. You can't stand in the presence of God in eternity if he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, and say, wait a minute, you never told me. I lived back in the day when there wasn't a printing press. I lived back in the day when there were no gospel preachers in this part of the world. God said that 
that, that case doesn't hold water. Because the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that are made. Now, the world book cannot save you. But it can render you inexcusable if you don't come to know God. That's what this verse says. You need to understand Romans 1.20. Well, cu coupled with verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them... For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of God, by or from the creation, by means of the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In John chapter 3, the person of the invisible God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was talking to one of the most learned and knowledgeable religionists that the world could produce in that day and age. His name was Nicodemus. He was uh, of the Pharisees, highly skilled in the things of God, knew the, knew the scriptures, taught the, the people the scriptures. And listen what Jesus says. Jesus says, Verily, verily, John chapter 3 and verse, let's start with verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit, Nicodemus. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. He said, You know the wind blows where it wills, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? He had a great knowledge of the Scriptures of the Old Testament, but he had no knowledge of the new birth. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a rabbi? Art thou a master in Israel? And knowest not these things? Jesus Christ expected Nicodemus to know of the things concerning the Holy Spirit. Dear soul, you say, well, all he had was the Old Testament. That's not true. He had the entire world. Everybody that had been saved from Adam all the way down to Nicodemus, whether they had a Bible or scriptures or not, they had the world book to give them understanding of God, and they had, to come to, they had come to know God. So Nicodemus was going to be condemned by those who didn't have the religious education he had, but had come to know God anyhow. Look at Isaiah chapter 5. The book of Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Isaiah 5, 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, until wine inflame thee. And the harp and the vial, the tabret, the pipe, and wine are in their feast. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. That verse right there, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 12, is a great commentary on Matthew chapter 24 and verse 39. It said they were married, given in marriage, they ate and they drank, and they knew not till the flood came and took them all away. The indictment against the world of Noah in order to destroy the entirety of the human population on the earth was... I gave you the world book. You didn't read it. You didn't come to understand God. You were involved with, his, with the pipe and the harp and the wine and the feast, but you regarded not God. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Appreciate that. Amen. Thank you, Brother. So here in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, you have a commentary on what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 39. What is the indictment against the world of Noah? This is all you're going to get. 
This is the indictment nailed on the courthouse door against man. You were eating and drinking and married and given in marriage. And you not till the flood came and took them all away. You say, well, what's wrong with eating and drinking? Because that was all they were doing. What's wrong with giving in marriage? Because that was all they were concerned about. They had no concern about God. They just wanted to satisfy their natural desires. And the Bible says here in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, that you were doing all those things. You were taking care of yourself and satisfying your own taste and your own lust. And it said, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Dear soul, you're put in this world not to just say, Oh, what a glorious sunset. Let's take a picture of that and put it up on our wall and see how, how, what a wonderful picture that made. And people can come into the house and say, Oh, I like that photograph you got there. Well, in the sunset, beautiful. Look how it gleams on this and it shines on that. But dear soul, they don't come to know God. That They don't, they don't uh, come to know God. Look at Isaiah chapter 22. You're not here just to say, Well, I want to go see the Grand Canyon. I want to go see, you know, uh, these, these great things in nature. Good. But you need to come away saying, I need, uh, I need to know God in this. Because that's how the whole world of Noah was condemned. Isaiah 22. And you got Bibles and they didn't. Isaiah 22, beginning with verse number 11. <clears throat> You made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool. Talking about how you made irrigation. All right, in, in Jerusalem. But you have not looked unto the maker thereof. Neither had respect unto him that fastened it long ago. You could see this ditch and you benefit from it. And the water come down to you and the irrigation was great. But you never thought about who, was, who it was that did it. In that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. But what did he see? But behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord God. God said there was a day when I called for mourning. They used to shave their heads in mourning, baldness, uh, put on sackcloth and ashes, weeping, confessing of sins. But they said, I ain't going to do that. Let's kill that, uh, that fatted calf and have, have a party. Let's have a barbecue. Let's enjoy ourselves. And what did they say? Eat and drink because tomorrow we're going to die. Not going to worry about death. We just want to satisfy the palate of our tongue right now. So God said he is, he is going uh, to, to bring judgment upon them for not uh, having a time of, of, of uh, repentance and seeing the things uh, of the Lord. Let's go to Psalm 19. David talks about two different books he reads in Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, we have the world book, W-O-R-L-D, having to do with creation. He could read the world book. But beginning with verse number 7, he had the word W-O-R-D, word book. The law of the Lord is perfect. And he talks about God's statutes and uh, uh, about the world uh, as he sees in the scriptures. So there's two different books that David reads from. Not just the scriptures, beginning with verse 7 of Psalm 19, but with the world book, beginning with verse number 1. Listen to what he says are the characteristics of the things that he can see and draw from in the world book. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his, God's handiwork. Listen now. Day unto day uttereth speech. 
Did you hear anything about God when you got out of bed this morning? That day in some way has uttered a speech, uttered a voice concerning God. He said, so that the things that are made reveal the invisibility of God, even His power and Godhead, so that if you don't see Him, you're without excuse. It renders you inexcusable. He says, day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is a revelation of God in creation. That's what it's all about. Listen. Verse number three, you say, well, what about the guy over in China? He doesn't speak English. What about the guy in Israel that speaks Hebrew? What about the guy in Russia that doesn't speak either one of those languages? It doesn't matter. The world book is heard in every language there is without exception. Verse number three, Psalm 19. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I may look up at that shiny glowing object at night and call it the moon in English. I don't know what the Chinese call it in their language. I don't know Chinese. Well, the people in Mexico, they call it something else. I don't know the Spanish word for the moon. I don't know the French word for the moon. But it's the same object. What they're seeing is what I'm seeing. And what I'm seeing is what they're seeing. And it's what men down through the thousands of years of human history have always seen. Night unto night uttereth knowledge. There is no speech, no language, where their voice is not heard. You must realize, dear soul, and we'll look at as God wills and time allows, at Revelation chapter 12 and see the woman with that's standing on the sun excuse me the standing on the moon with, with reflecting the sun in, in her righteousness the church is, is, is depicted by the moon has no light of its own the moon is not a fireball like the sun but it does reflect the light of the sun into the darkness of the night that's a picture of the church that's why God said it that way. And he said the stars that twinkle in the sky in the darkness are the ministers that are in his hand. Wake up. You're supposed to know these things. You will be judged by God whether you do or don't know them. There is no, their line, those things that they, they present, goes out through all the earth. Their words go to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of the chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. The sun is like the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. And he said, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of life. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness. So the Lord Jesus Christ is depicted by the S-U-N as He is the S-O-N and all the planets revolve around Him who is the center of the universe. There's enough gospel in created order to condemn everybody that's ever lived who has not come to understand and know the being of God. That's what Romans 1, 18-20 tells you. So he says, His going forth is from the end of the heaven, His circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Did you get up on a cold morning in Russia, in Siberia, or wherever? How'd you get warm? The sun came up. Did you uh, get up and freeze to death somewhere in Japan on a cold morning? How did you get warm? The sun came up. The same sun that warmed the, the Italian is the same sun that warmed the Frenchman. The same sun that warmed the Hispanic. Everybody down through the ages, whether they were in Babylon or wherever they were, 
they knew the sun, S-U-N, and, and the Egyptians made a big deal about the sun. They called him Ra, R-A. They worshipped him. Dear soul, they came that close to seeing the glory of the sun, but they took it to the devil and worshipped him and made idols out of it and, and had a false religion, and, it, and it, it sent them all to hell that didn't come to know and understand the person of God. He's the one that created it, not Ra. God is the one that set it forth, not anybody else. It didn't just happen by the great uh, boom, you know, some explosion and it all splattered out into space. That's stupid. The heavens declare the glory of God. And dear soul, that is to come to know God. You have to deny and to destroy the consciousness of God out of your soul if you come to understand and see the sun, moon, and stars in any other way other than bringing you to the knowledge of the person of God himself. So we see, dear soul, that the heavens declare the glory of God. There's the world book. And then in verse 7 of Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right. Uh, verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean. And, and so it, it goes on down talking about the scriptures. So there's two books that man can come to know God by. The world book, Psalm 19, 1 through 6, they go into all the earth. You don't have to go to language school to be able to understand the, the ministers of the gospel as set forth by the sun, moon, and stars by day and night. Their language is heard by everybody. Nobody's excluded. So for thousands of years of human history, people came to understand and to know God by the Holy Spirit revealing Him through the creation and the created order. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, the book of Hebrews, I'll get there in a minute, chapter 11. How is it known? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance, the confidence of things hoped for. It is the evidence or the essence and the assurance of things not seen. Jesus Christ is both the author who began faith and the finisher who will bring faith to its ultimate and uh, blessed end. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the author of faith. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Who are the elders? Everybody that believed God. And it says, through faith, we understand. So, dear soul, when you have God grant you the gift of faith, you can see God all around you whether you had a Bible or not, whether you had a local church or not. And so we see, he says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Don't give me this Big Bang theory. I have faith, and I understand by faith that these worlds were framed by the Word of God Himself. He says, so that things which are seen we're not made of things which do appear. Where would God go to buy the materials to create the world? There was nothing. Nothing. People read, uh, these preachers at funerals read John 14 and say, I go to prepare a place for you. And they say, dear beloved, I know you've lost your loved one. But God is up there with hammer and nail and fashioning you a, 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 a great uh, home and a great cathedral, a great, you know, uh, mansion in the sky. That's stupid. Jesus didn't say, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to heaven. And, and because I was Joseph the carpenter's son, which is dumb. He said, I'm God's son. 
I'm going to the cross to prepare a place for you in redemption. I'm going to buy you your uh, eternal uh, life by my blood. I'm going to wash you in the blood of the Lamb. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. We are being lied to, deceived. Religion in America has been turned over to the devil, and Satan is deceiving us right and left. Dear soul, you don't really know that many true Christians. You may really know a lot of church members. But dear soul, we can't st sit there and listen to a man say, Jesus is in heaven building your mansion. Because he was Joseph the carpenter's son. You're just going to make him physical. You're just going to make him carnal. Dear soul, he is God the Son. He spoke the world into existence. By faith we understand that the worlds were made by the Word of God. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. This Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. And while we hear in Hebrews chapter 11... Uh, we should, we should read verses 4 and 5. Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, for by it he being dead yet speaketh. Listen, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and he knew you couldn't approach God without a blood sacrifice. How did he come to know that? He didn't have a Bible. His, his mama was the one that plunged us all into, into sinful shame. How did he come? By faith. He was granted faith. We're going to see later about Enoch. How he, when did he come to walk with God? It was after his wife had a baby. She shall be saved in childbearing. Or they shall be, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue. So he, he was able to see things concerning God by the natural birth. It was my great pleasure to be able to hold my, our little newborn great-grandchild in my arms yesterday. And my wife also. Her mom and daddy... Our granddaughter and her husband came down and brought little, uh, little Sophia to, to see her great-grandparents for the first time. Wiggly little old thing, small. It is amazing holding that tiny little child in my arms and thanking God for the new birth. It was just wonderful that the, prior to preaching this message today, God let me hold that tiny little infant one month old yesterday. And her grandmama held her and said, wow, she's warm as toast. And she warmed her grandmama up. It, her great-grandmama, I'm sorry. It, it was amazing. God is so good. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him, for he had this testimony uh, and bef for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Let's go back and see that. How did Enoch come to the place to where he pleased God? Go back to Genesis chapter 5. The book of Genesis chapter 5. And I think it's verse 21. We'll see. Genesis chapter 5 and verse number... 21, yes. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. One verse. What does it say about Enoch? It says there's nothing to report about him as far as the spiritual things for 65 years. What did he do for 65 years? I don't know. Got up every morning, went to work, whatever his job was. Whatever he did to make a living, he did everything that's normal and natural, but there's nothing to report about him except one thing. After 65 years of just carnal living, 
his wife had a baby. He begat Methuselah. And then it says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. I don't know exactly what happened, but I can tell you when it happened. When Enoch, who was able to be translated so that God took him and he didn't have to go through death, I can tell you exactly when it happened that he began to understand and perceive and know God. When his wife had a baby, she shall be saved in childbearing. And they shall be saved in, if they continue in faith and sobriety and walking by faith. So all of the females shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith. The birth had something to do with the revelation of God. Nicodemus, yes, you must be born again. How does that work? And Jesus said, wait a minute. How did you get to be a rabbi in Israel and you don't know this? You should know that the heavens declare the glory of God. You should know it. He held him accountable for knowing, or rather for not knowing, that the birth of the human uh, being was a revelation of how God gets you into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. John 3.3 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. John 3, 5. John 3, 8. Everyone that is born of the Spirit is like the wind that blows. You can't see it. You can't tell it. Enoch looked just like he did the day before. Enoch said, come on in. Your wife just had a baby. Bam, he's different. He don't look any different. Got on the same clothes he had on before she had the baby. He's the same height, he's the same feature, he speaks the same language, he does the same things to make a living that he did. But everything was different. The Bible said Enoch lived 60 and 5 years. What do you have to say about him concerning redemption? Nothing. Well, what happened then? And begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah, it marks Enoch's change. And this man is going to please God so much. He had this testimony that he pleased God. Hebrews chapter 11. We read you that. And so he said, he walked with God after he begat Methuselah, Methuselah 300 years. And he begat other sons and daughters. 65 years Nothing, do, nothing going on. Got anything to write, Moses? Nope. Moses is writing the book of Genesis. Said, now we've got to talk, tell about Enoch. What are you going to tell about him for 65 years? Nothing. Don't say that there was anything happened to him. No angels appeared unto him. That, there was nothing given to him from God. There was nothing given from him to God. Just he lived 65 years. But then... After he begat Methuselah, at the point of his wife giving birth to his son, Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. You can separate Enoch's life into two segments, 65 years, 300 years. All of his life was 365 years. But the first part of it, nothing to report. The last part of it, Enoch walked with God in an age of ungodliness. All the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually, and God repented that he made man. And Enoch had like a great-grandson, and they named him Noah. Noah means comfort. These children were given, these births were given with a revelation so that they named them the names that they believed that God was going to perform. Noah shall bring us comfort from this ungodly generation that is going to displease God so much that God is going to destroy them all. The fountains of the great deep shall be broken up and the windows of heaven shall be opened 
and there's going to be a flood, a worldwide flood. It shall drown everything and everybody except those that are in the ark. And who's the one that God told to build the ark? Noah. He's the one that brought them comfort from the ungodliness. It was a birth that caused them to know, to name him Noah. And Enoch walked with God, verse 24 of, of Genesis 5, and he was not, for God took him. He came into blameless, habitual fellowship with God. And God began to give that ungodly generation that shall so displease God and it make God repent that he ever made them. Didn't even want to look at them. Get them out of my sight. Drowned them all. Why? They didn't have Bibles. But they had births. How did Enoch come to walk with God? His wife had a baby. And Methuselah is going to live longer than any other individual. And when he dies after 969 years, the flood comes. So, dear soul, they didn't know, uh, they didn't have a Bible. But let me take a little bit of liberty and say, when they looked on the seat of Methuselah's britches, on his diaper, it said, uh, there was a message that said, when he dies, it shall come. That's not literally true. I'm just preaching to you and trying to get you to understand something. How do they know the name Noah Comfort? They just understood that somehow or another by this birth, God's going to do something different. Methuselah, we're going to name him Methuselah because he's going to live longer than any other man's ever lived. Why? Because God is long-suffering. And he let him live until the floods came. And he died, dear soul, in the year the floods came and took them all away. This was a revelation of God. Enoch and Methuselah and Noah, this period of time, there was a great revelation of God to this people, this line, because God would manifest himself by births. She shall be saved in childbearing. She shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith. As long as you continue to walk by faith and see that Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, you must be born from above. Wait a minute. How does that happen? Well, God gave you natural birth to give you an understanding of the spiritual birth. How did Sophia come into this world? When when our granddaughter and, and uh, Antonio got together, when they became a couple, dear soul, there was the penetration of the male into the darkness of the female, implanted the seed, and from that there was conception and birth. That's how you get saved. God Almighty, the male, the head, Christ, by the Holy Spirit, penetrates the sinner's heart and goes into that darkness and quickens them and makes them alive and, and puts the seed of the woman into them. And they come to know God. And God has never had a miscarriage. There's all those people who conceived by the Holy Spirit have a birth. How can these things be? How did you get to be a rabbi and you don't know these things? Go back in the Old Testament, dear soul, and you'll have a hard time finding scriptures that say you must be born again. You can find like in Ezekiel, what, 35, about giving them a new heart and seeing how God implies things just very lightheartedly. The scriptures don't have the, the hard evidence, verse by verse, word by word evidence of this, but the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his hand to work. Day unto day uttereth knowledge, and night unto night uttereth speech, so that they are without excuse. So that the things, the invisible things, and the essence of all the glory of Almighty God is, is evidenced by the things that are made. Well, I want to go see the Grand Canyon. Well, look at these pictures. We want to show you, you know, two hours worth of slides and bore you to death to show you our vacation to the Grand Canyon. 
But what did you learn? It was hot. And it's a lot of erosion. But there's some pretty colors out there as you see the strata as the erosion cut on down into the earth. But what did you learn? Is that it? Then they are without excuse. They are without excuse. Well, it said on the news there's going to be an eclipse tonight, so let's all go out and stand in the yard and watch. What did you learn? Wow, it was amazing to see that. To see one planet coming in between us and the moon or whatever. There's an eclipse during the day, some planet coming between us and the sun. What did you learn? Well, science says this. But what did you learn about God? If you didn't learn anything about God, you'd be rendered without excuse. So how in the world can God condemn and judge an, an entire race, dear soul, except the heavens declare the glory of God and dear soul, births have a revelation of God because that's how you get into the kingdom. You must be born again. That's the way that it is. Listen at Micah chapter 5. The book of Micah chapter 5. Beginning with verse number 1. Micah chapter 5 and verse number 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth, <coughs> excuse me, unto me, one that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Talking about Jesus. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, till the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. There's going to be judgment in, in Israel to such a degree, dear soul, until she, how does it say, which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. It's going to be done in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, little among the thousands of Judah. Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me he that is going to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Jesus Christ, as the eternal Son of God, always has been. As long as God the Father has been, He's had God the Son. God the Father didn't have to have a son in order to become a father. God the Father was a father because He had a son. Always has had a son. Jesus Christ, listen, listen to me. The eternal Son of God had, did not have to get here to be here. He was already here before He got here. But He came to be known as Jesus. She which travaileth hath brought forth. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12. I told you we was going to get to this. Thank God we can. The book of Revelation, chapter 12. The Bible said there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. That's the church. And the moon under her feet. She does not originate light. But Jesus who said I am the light of the world and I am the light of life. Also said to the church ye are the light of the world. We reflect the light of Jesus in the darkness of sinful night. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Her tiara is the gospel ministry. She being with child cried, travailing in birth. This is fulfilling the prophecy in that we just read you in Michael, Micah chapter 5 and verse 3. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. 
And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, Satan, is right there, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. He's, he, he's an imitator. He's a counterfeit. He puts the crowns on his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. The angels were, were cast down a third of them and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as he was born. I'm going to kill Jesus and I'm going to be God. I shall be like the Most High. Verse 5, Revelation 12. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Micah chapter 5. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the world woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God. I told you John 14 says I go to prepare a place for you and God is going to fix it so that the church can dwell in this earth without being destroyed by Satan. The gates of hell shall not prevail against you. You shall be taken care of. You have a place in the wilderness. What's the wilderness? It's the world where the church lives, scattered like salt and sprinkled throughout all the population of mankind. And so we see, dear soul, that she comes to be, uh, have, have the place prepared for God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. How long is that? That's the long as the church age lasts. Don't try to figure it out mathematically. Just know that God is pleased for the church to dwell on earth and to be and to survive and be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And she is the uh, the church is the child. The church is the woman that brought forth the man child Jesus. He was born uh, of woman made under the law, and he he, he was brought forth uh, by God through the Virgin Mary. And this so listen. In Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, the prophecy of him is set forth by the angel. And the virgin espoused, uh, listen, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Luke one twenty six. To a virgin espoused, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel came into her and said, Hail Mary, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, not above women. You don't pray to Mary. She was a sinner just like everybody else. Listen, blessed art thou among women. That's why it changes. The tense from the singular, if she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue, she continued in faith, and she is therefore involved in this too. She was troubled at the angel's saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Listen. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Here comes the birth. Here comes the birth. You must be born again. She shall be saved. They shall be saved. I'll get it right. She shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith. Dear soul, you women that are having babies, you continue in faith. You can see the revelation of the glory of God in that birth. Listen, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son. It will not be a, a miscarriage and you don't have to have a gender party, gender reveal party, whatever in the heaven that is. You shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He said, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Listen, Matthew 1, it says, He shall save his people from their sins. What did his name mean? Jesus, Jehovah saves. 
Here was a revelation of God by a birth. That's been happening down through the ages. If, if you will study the scriptures, you will see, dear soul, that God gave uh, revelation uh, by names. Name him Noah. Why? Because God said he's going to comfort us. Uh, thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. Genesis chapter 8. If you'll read that, I don't have time. Our time's getting away so fast. And, and dear soul, uh, it, 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 if, you'll, if you'll read these passages of Scripture, uh, Isaiah chapter 8, I'm sorry, not Genesis. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. If you can pronounce that first name, you're doing better than me. It, it, it takes hinges on it to get around the corner. It, it's so long. There's so many syllables in that name. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shal Al Bash Hash Baz. That's terrible, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's the best I can do. And it says, You shall call his name that which I just said in Isaiah 8 3, 4. Before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, before he learns how to talk. The riches of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. What does that long name mean? The margin says that big long name that I messed up trying to pronounce in Isaiah chapter 8 verse number 3 and verse number 1 means before the king of Assyria shall take away the riches. No wonder it was so long. That's what it meant. God says it's going to be a birth. Here's going to be the name. What does it mean? It means before the king of Assyria shall take away the riches. There was a revelation of God by birth. That's what it means. She shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith. And dear soul, you come to understand. And it's been my privilege over the years as a pastor to be able to go and, uh, and, and, and visit Parents in the hospital as they have just had a baby and they are delighted with the things of God and at that particular time it's the best time that I have found out by the Holy Spirit to present unto them these things that I'm stumbling in trying to present to you today and make you understand that the natural birth is that which God uses to give us understanding of the spiritual birth. And I used this first last week, I'll probably use it again next week, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's still in my Bible. John 16 and, and, and verse number 21. John 16, 21. A woman when she is in travail has sorrow. When you're lost, you don't have anything but chaos and sorrow in your soul because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. That verse right there proves to you that once the birth takes place, the anguish is replaced by joy. That's what happened in, in Enoch's life. Enoch lived 65 years. What do you want to say about him? Nothing. There ain't nothing about God in his life at all. But then what happened? His wife had a baby. What was his name? Methuselah. He lived longer than anybody else because he's going to die just before the flood comes. There was a revelation of God so great in his wife having a baby that it says after Methuselah had a... It actually says after Methuselah's wife had a baby, he walked with God. It was the birth in the natural that brought him to an understanding of the birth in the spiritual for the things, invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that are made. So the anguish and the trouble and the travail is overcome by the joy of the birth. And God puts joy in our hearts by the new birth. How did you know that you were saved? Because there was such joy in my soul. And I knew old things had passed away. Behold, all things had become new. Let's finish up with 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 5, verse 15. And that Christ died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, once you understand that Christ died for you, and he resurrects you in your heart and you're born again, wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Something happens when God comes into your soul and you're no longer judging and knowing and understanding things by the natural man. Enoch lived 65 years. What about it? Nothing. But when his wife had a baby, he walked with God in so much that he had this testimony that he pleased God and God took him on home with him without him dying. And he was not, for God took him. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh in his physical birth, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Get that dead Jesus down off of that cross on that crucifix and, and sing to your soul, we serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. And you don't want to just come to know Jesus, that hippie-looking guy with a beard and sandals and a robe. You come to know Him by the Holy Spirit. Next verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Once the spiritual birth happens, all things become new. How is the spiritual birth understood? It is understood by the physical birth. And, and God says to you, and it's in, let me show it, Matthew 23, 9 and 10, don't call any man father on this earth. Jesus said, my brothers and mothers and sisters, Matthew chapter 12, are those that do the will of God. He said, these, fel these fellows that are standing outside that are the sons of Joseph, that's not my mother. Let me tell you who my family is. My family are those that do the will of God in Matthew chapter 12. And he says, from henceforth, don't call any man on earth father. But what do the Roman Catholics do? Father this and Father that. What did Jesus say about that? Our Father which art in heaven. The new birth, dear soul, changes everything. And it's manifest by the natural birth. And you were born into the world, dear soul, from your mother's womb. So you are without excuse. Every person in the world, though they did not have a Bible or hear a preached message, makes no difference. They got into the world by birth. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, how can you be a rabbi in Israel and not know these things? God have mercy. I hope this message will help you. I thank the Lord for giving us an understanding of she shall be saved in childbearing. May God bless you. Thank you. of our God and